Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jenny McKenna. I am the president of the Upper Arlington Board of Education, and I would like to welcome you all here tonight. I just want to share a little bit about the framework we are using for the evening. This is our Listen, Learn, Lead campaign, which we started three years ago. Um, we started a listening campaign for the board shortly after the end of all of the COVID restrictions. Um, it was a listening tour to help build, rebuild trust and transparency between the community and our, um, the schools. Our second iteration of that was after we hired our superintendent, Dr. Hunt, so he could spend some time um, with our community to learn about what was important to our schools and our community in his first year. This is our third iteration of our Listen, Learn, Lead initiative and it is to gather feedback on our strategic plan. We are still in the midst of planning. These are draft recommendations. Um, we will, I think there will be someone who will kind of share that whole process. Um, and so we're excited that you're here um, to hear about those draft recommendations and we're excited to get your feedback. So I'd like to kind of figure out who is in the room. So. If I, as, if I say your group that you belong with, if you could please stand up. So do we have any students in the room? How about alumni? Parents or families of current students? Community members? <laughs> um, staff? And we do have, I'm gonna introduce our current board members who are here. We have Lori Trent, Liz Stump, and Nidhi Satiani. How about our strategic coordination team members? And finally, our inquiry team members. We are so appreciative for you all to be here. And I'm going to turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Hunt. Uh, thank you, Ms. McKenna. I certainly appreciate all of you being here. Uh, there's a bit of irony <clears throat> in this evening. Uh, the inquiry teams have met diligently over the course of the last couple of months, and it didn't matter um, what date or time the meetings were scheduled. It was 80 degrees and sunny out for every one of those meetings. Um, uh, this evening, obviously a little different, but first and foremost, thank you all for being here. And thank you for those of you who have given up your time and your energy uh, to be a part of this process. Uh, when we're on the other side of this, thousands of people will have been engaged in giving input to and designing the future of our schools. And when I think about the strength of Upper Arlington as the new su superintendent coming in, it's that we work really hard to ensure that what we offer to our students is a reflection of the desires uh, of, of this community. And this process is designed uh, to hopefully, at the other side of this, um, create the next iteration of excellence uh, for our school. Uh, before I jump into this evening, I think it's really important uh, to recognize that uh, today we had an in incident in one of our middle schools, and if you, you don't know, um, we had uh, a phone call threatening violence at Hastings Middle School. And we worked you know, really hard uh, with our communications, our crisis team, with the building to communicate with our parents uh, regarding that issue and worked collaboratively with Upper Arlington Police Department uh, to resolve uh, and address the issue. At any time, especially with all that's going on in the world, when there's an incident of safety and, and security, it, it causes you to reflect on what you have in place and, and what you do for students. I think. Um, also, from a leadership perspective, it's always important to 
post-incident take the time to reflect on what did we do well and what maybe what should we do different in the future. And we have structured those meetings and we will have them going forward and certainly your feedback on that uh, is, is uh, appreciated. Uh, I, I've studied a lot in the area of school safety and uh, the importance of planning and practicing um, I think played itself out this morning with our staff. I want to thank our staff. Um, they're on the front lines of having to interact and keep our students calm uh, and, and, and reassured that things are going to be okay. I also have, have been in environments where the relationship between police and city and school are not positive. And here, that is not the case. That we have such a positive and productive relationship and an ability to communicate and respond quickly is very, very important. And I think today demonstrated how quick uh, that relationship and the response will be uh, for our students. The good news is this was a hoax. And unfortunately, we're seeing this a lot uh, in school districts, not just here, but nationally. Uh, but it is a reminder of the importance of what we do every single day uh, and the importance of safety and security being at the foundation. In fact, after our crisis team finished today, we reflected and we thought, you know, tonight we're going to be talking about strategic plan, the strategic direction of our district. Where does safety and security fit in there? And, and where does that play itself out? So maybe as we gather your feedback tonight, that'll be a piece of this is to more overtly express that priority because it is a priority here uh, and will continue to be as we move forward. So I did want to take a, a few minutes uh, to address that and speak to that this evening before we jumped in. Um, I, I'm excited to be here and have the third iteration of Listen, Learn and Lead as we engage with the community uh, about our school districts. And tonight is extremely important as we have a lot of people in here that have worked really hard to dig into data and information not only from our constituents and our, and our students, our community members and our parents, but also looked at what's going on in the, the landscape of education nationally in terms of best practice and, and where, where do we need to be. And that really is the, the basis of some of the recommendations you're gonna see tonight. But tonight is about us hearing from you and getting feedback so we can take that in, so we can learn about that. So as we move into the next phase of this, which is what is the actual work going to be? What's the implementation plan going to look like? Uh, we can take and, and have all of your feedback in there. Uh, as I entered into the district, many of you know, I, I went on this UA adventure. I spent a lot of time sitting down talking to our students and our staff. Uh, and, and poor Karen Trout and Colleen had to follow me around and, and document all of that. Uh, one thing came and resonated very quickly was that the, the, the vision of this uh, organization the what do we want to be, what do we hope to create for our students is very, very relevant and still timely and, and there's still dedication uh, and support to it. The mission of how are we going to get to that vision, uh, again, resonated and, and people felt that it was very strong and it needed to stay in place. So beyond it, all of these things being in the gym floor and, and, and written on the walls, um, they're deep ingrained in who we are and they will remain in place. So when you think about strategic planning, you always start with vision and mission. And the actions, these recommendations that you read tonight should be things that move us towards that gap between where we are today in current state and where we want to be as a school district. Uh, the other thing that I, I did want to point out, you, you all received a quality profile uh, in your mailbox, and that's a summary annually that the community gets on the work that we have done. Uh, the current strategic plan that has been that is in place actually sunsets in December of 24. So this process will continue as we move forward. So tonight is one point in time. It's certainly not an ending. It's an opportunity for us to get more feedback and bring that feedback to our board to work with what are these final strategic recommendations going to look like, so we can then enter into strategic planning or uh, the implementation planning. Uh, so you, you, we work from the quality profile. There were a couple other reports that we leaned on as well. The, the, the uh, UA Adventure report that's on our website, the, the, the uh, collection of all of the data information that uh, was gathered this fall, as well as the Insight report. And you're gonna hear from inquiry teams tonight that dug into a, a, a vast uh, amount of research and information, uh, looking at research nationally, but also locally, that, that are driving some of the recommendations 
uh, that you have. Uh, I also wanted to put this up as, as we kind of move forward. There's been an, an understanding and realization that No Child Left Behind, the attempt was that let's reform education through testing. Let's just test kids more and that'll make things better. And I think as we, we, we played that out, we realized there's a heck of a lot more to education than just test results. And this district, along with many others, some call it a profile of a graduate. Uh, at UA, we call it profile of an engaged learner, said we need to look at and define what are the skills and competencies we want to develop in young people. Because yes, there's foundational knowledge kids have to know, but there's also critical skills and competencies we want to develop. So as you think about these recommendations, I want you to think about these skills and how they're embedded in what we're trying to do with kids because it's really important to make this a reality that our plan drives us in that direction. And we, we have three key areas that you're gonna hear about tonight and I'm not gonna read this slide to you because you're gonna hear a lot about each of these areas, but the three areas that kind of surfaced from all the data, uh, one was engaged learning and I think if you, you know, connect to the old plan, that's that whole child approach. Uh, I think the decision to move towards engagement was around that profile of engaged learner. And you can see up there the inquiry question that the inquiry team started with. The second bucket being well-being and belonging. Again, looking at prior plans, uh, the feedback was there is a lot of work that has been, that has been done in this district for student and staff well-being that needs to continue. Mental health issues, supporting of our staff and our students from a well-being perspective remains very important and needs to be a cr critical component of the plan. And the last is new connections and communication. And again, you're gonna hear from the, those that dug into this work. So I'll let them walk you through what this looks like. Uh, two words kept coming up as, as I went through this tour. Uh, this idea of excellence and in innovation. And we felt like, how do we incorporate that into this plan? And we really believe these are overarching themes. And we asked our strategic coordination team to wrestle with what do, what do these things look like here in UA? So excellence and innovation is gonna kind of be the umbrella of the plan and the definitions are, uh, are up there for, for you to see. Um, excellence, this idea of continuous improvement. I was, I was having a conversation earlier. Uh, we, this district was in, in, is in a very, very good place. This isn't about we need dramatic change. This is about what are we doing really, really well and what do we need to, to do to take it to the next level? and that idea of continuous improvement and excellence. And then the other concept of innovation, the district has been known for a place that will attempt risk and try new things, and we want to keep that into our culture as we move this plan forward. So you'll see those two words uh, kind of overarching our plan. Um, I, we do wanna give you kind of a brief overview of the process uh, and kind of where, where we've been and where we're at tonight and where we're going. And uh, to do that, uh, you've heard probably enough from me. I'm gonna at least change up the speaker. I'm gonna introduce uh, our deputy superintendent, uh, Dr. Stephanie Siddons, to walk us through that, that portion of the presentation. Hello, uh, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm really excited to talk about the process. And um, Denise Snowden and I will be talking about kind of the initial stages. And then Dr. Hunt will again, you'll see him again towards the end to hear more about the final stages. Um, so I'm going to actually go to the next slide. So one of the uh, great things about this process is we've been very intentional about having collaborative team structure so that um, we had three key sets of groups of stakeholders that really helped us um, with this process. So, and you kind of got a sense of those groups by, through the introductions. Um, first, we had a district core team, and that essentially is Dr. Hunter, superintendent, myself, Denise Snowden, and our communications chief. And so we meet weekly to ensure that we're executing and monitoring the strategic plan process. We also have the strategic coordination team that is approximately 25 individuals that represent uh, parents or guardians, staff members, as well as community members. And so they have met uh, with us uh, several times and we meet about monthly, I think. Um, and essentially they are providing direction and feedback to the inquiry teams. And they provide a really important role because they kind of help us test out uh, our ideas and they give us feedback and then we have that great feedback loop. 
Um, the other piece is the inquiry teams, which again, you're gonna hear from all three of our teams tonight. Uh, uh, but each team is around those three areas that Dr. Hunt just described around engaged learning, well-being and belonging, and connection and communication. And uh, we have over 50 individuals that are involved in uh, across the three teams, and that involves community members, parents. We also have students on the, our groups, and we're, we've been really excited to have students engaged. Uh, and we have also community members, uh, parents, guardians as well. So uh, their job, again, is to help us really research best practices and inform the drafting of the strategic priorities and recommendations. So again, that's our focus tonight. So this visual just helps you kind of see our roadmap for the strategic planning process. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the design process uh, that began essentially in the fall. And then uh, the second phase was around our discovery phase, which is what you're hearing about tonight, which is the inquiry process. And then Dr. Hunt will get into a little more detail about the next stages as we get into the fall of next year and finalize the plan. Uh, in December of 2024. So you heard a little bit from uh, Board President McKenna and Dr. Hunt about uh, this very rich stakeholder engagement processes that we use in Upper Arlington, but we've been very intentional about making sure that our inquiry teams have really leveraged uh, our Listen, Learn, Lead sessions and our UA adventure that Dr. Hunt just uh, described to you, as well as our equity audit information. And so all of these, as Dr. Hunt indicated, the reports are available on our website. Uh, but you can see from this slide kind of the number of touch points that we had with individuals in our community. These were done through either direct engagement, through focus groups or town hall style meetings or through surveys. And so we ca captured a lot of really great data. Um, I will note that Dr. Hunt's UA adventure sessions were really great. I had an opportunity to see some of those and those were opportunities for parents, for family members, for students and staff to all provide really important feedback about priorities and areas of focus. And so those were great opportunities that he was very intentional about engaging in the fall. Uh, and then I'll also add that in the Inside Education Group Equity Audit, that was giving us a lot of good information about programming related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, as well as any professional development needs we might have, and ret retention and recruitment efforts for our team as well. So that kind of gives you a really brief overview of our key uh, design stages. And I'm gonna turn it over to Denise, who will now get into the second phase of our process, which is our focus tonight. I'm the facilitator of the strategic planning process. So I've gotten to know a lot about uh, your community. And this is the third time I've done it. So since 2014, I've been part of the facilitation of the process. I'm very um, honored to be back to do that again. And I've done a lot of other things in Upper Arlington. Um, but I'm also, I just at the core, I'm a, a middle school educator who just happened to leave my practice 23 years ago to do adult education. Ended up teaching at Ohio State a little while uh, for about six years too for people who want to become principals and administrators. So most of my work is actually in executive leadership coaching. Strategic planning is really part of that too. So um, I'm here to kind of just be the MC tonight. So I'm just gonna be a back and forth um, because there's a lot of information we're gonna be sharing with you and then we're gonna be engaging your feedback at three different times and then we're gonna have a and a at the end, uh, which is why you have index cards and I'll tell you about those in just a minute. Um, you're gonna be on your butts. So there's gonna be a couple times I might ask you like to stand up and twirl or stretch or anything like that uh, just so that you don't like get numb. Uh, we, we want your brains you know, and your bodies to be in sync. Um, so. Where we, what we have up here, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, it's just kind of showing something that Dr. Hunt mentioned earlier. It's just getting from where we are to where we want to be, what is the current state, what's the desired future, and those have been the biggest questions that guided the inquiry process. So three inquiry teams. Uh, we've had teams as large as 25 people. Our smallest team has about a dozen. Uh, so overall, we have 75 people total involved between the strategic coordination team and the inquiry teams. Um, so mission, vision, values, profile of an engaged learner, all driven by excellence and innovation. And what you're gonna hear today is really the answer to that middle bubble, right? What strategies, and these are high level strategies, 
right, that can get us from where we are now to where we want to be. So we had to figure out what is that desired future, right? What is the current state? And then what are those innovative practices? And you'll see some of the things that are recommended are expanding or building on current practices. So you'll see those verbs like that that say to expand or to elevate something in existence. And then you'll see some that start with develop or create, indicating that we want to start something new, right, or have a new priority and strategy within that. So it's not something that, that is in existence yet. So you'll notice both of those types of, of verbs indicating if it's something that's already in practice that we're just trying to strengthen or something we want to start new. Um, the inquiry team journey, this is just kind of a layout. I don't expect you to read the whole thing. But where we are today is number six. They have drafted strategy recommendations. And we're asking for your feedback. Um, we're also going to be meeting with the board members for their individual feedback this week or next week. It's going to be posted for seven or eight days. Uh, we have to close the feedback loop around May 21st. Because on May 22nd, the inquiry team will meet again, all three inquiry teams, and they're going to be doing number seven, which is revising and applying the feedback that we get from you today, um, from the board, and also from on the community that's going to be virtually giving us their feedback as well. So that's where we're going. Um, after all that's done and all that's been completed, each of the inquiry teams also, there's going to be a briefing report that represents what they actually did. So you'll be able to read, and they'll be posted online, they always are, that outlines um, what their area was, uh, what they did, so you can learn a little bit more details about the inquiry process. Um, if there are resources that are mentioned today that they, that they mention, you'll see that those are also linked on there. There'll be a reference, there'll be an appendix um, of all the summary of learnings from everything that they learned. And then the final um, recommendations, the strategy recommendations will also be included in there. So there'll be three comprehensive briefing reports to look forward to for your summer beach reading. Right. <laughs> um, the last little framework that we've kind of um, used every single time that we've been together is just a reminder that, you know, we're really looking for the future, right? The, the students right now in kindergarten, what year will they graduate? 2037. Is it right? 2037? Okay, I know it's like every year I'm like, what is it? All I know, well, maybe it's 2036, but if they're born now, they're going to be like graduating in 2040. So even though we're really aiming to 2030 and we're looking at a lot of research that's going to be projections for future forecasting for 2030, we're also looking beyond that uh, because we know that the things that happen in elementary school today matter, right, for when they graduate. Uh, so there's a, so many things. It's not just about graduation. We want to think, think beyond that. And the world is changing. Anyone agree? <laughs> like, it's hard to keep up. And I just feel like, do I want to keep learning all this? Because there's so much to learn all the time. So we really position it, we're looking at education in the future, like what would that look like? And you can see some of those questions around like where will learning occur, right? What will our schools be like, right? What will technology be like? Those are more concrete things. But we're also considering education now for the future. So what do we need to be doing today to ensure that our students are equipped with those knowledge, with the skills, with the opportunities for their world tomorrow. And honestly, it's been a little hard, right? Because we have to, it's uncomfortable thinking too far out. And it's like some people get really excited and other people get anxious about, oh my gosh, like AI and what's going on or, you know, what is machine human partnership? What does that mean, you know, and how does that work? And how important it, it, some industries are and how, Maybe some other industries aren't going to be as dominant, and they might be, be shifting. But we've all been through this before, right? Any, I mean, all of us from many generations have been through lots and lots of change. So we know that we just have to keep moving forward and help our, our children to adapt as well. Uh, Dr. Hahn, I'm going to have you come over if you want to talk about next steps, and then I'm going to get us ready for the inquiry teams. Great. Yeah, so af after we finalize these strategies with our Board of Education, we're, we will spend the fall really working with those that are implementing this plan to develop what those implementation plans look like. So the goal would be to take those out to staff, uh, get feedback on what actions 
that we need to take as a school district uh, in our schools to move forward towards those recommendations. Uh, another team that has been kind of key to strategic planning and the implementation of strategic plan here is the uh, teaching and learning team. So they'll play a big role in the development of that next fall. So when we get to January of 25, we are rolling this thing out um, and moving forward. So uh, that's a lot of background. We did it as quick as we possibly could for you to give you context. Uh, but now for me is the most exciting point of the meeting because we're going to uh, give the, those that have been digging into each of these areas an opportunity to share with you their work and then hear from you in terms of feedback along the way. So We had two ways to collect feedback, and there are two different types of feedback. The first is the cards, and if there's need more cards, we can bring them around, or um, if there's pens too over there. The cards are for questions that you want to ask the inquiry teams today you're curious about something that would help the greater understanding and, and while the inquiry team members are here, each team is probably going to have you know, uh, you know, five to eight minutes at the end to answer and field some of those questions. Um, so those are direct questions for inquiry team members. I'm going to collect them a couple of different times, um, hand them off to them, and then at the end they'll be able to come up and address those questions. Okay, the other piece of feedback is through a QR code process. So after each inquiry team presents their strategy recommendations, um, we're gonna have a QR code come up on the screen um, and you can put your phone up there, right? Take a look at it. And we want you to rate each one of the strategy recommendations on a Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And then you have the opportunity for each one of those to also give us a little bit of your, your insight or questions or feedback about them. That's all optional. If there's anything on there you want to skip, you're willing, you, it's fine to skip it. Um, the only thing is we want to know who you are, just in terms of not who you are personally, but what are those groups. So if we're missing constituent groups, we need to know. Um, clearly, there's not a lot of students here, so we're going to need to figure out a way to also make sure we got students. We know, Ellen, you're out there you know, campaigning and, and getting <laughs> students involved. So um, we, do have, we did have other students on the team, too, um, but due to other um, um, engagements they had, they couldn't be here. Uh, so just Ellen's just representing all the students that were on the teams. Um, so two ways, you got your one way ready to go. Does anyone, raise your hand if you need um, a card. Okay, good. And then Greg, you can be the card distributor. So we'll just do that and say, hey Greg. Um, the last thing I wanna mention, um, is that if you also are not comfortable when we get to the part where you use a QR code, we do have printed versions for you to complete. Um, so you can do that and then give that to us. Um, so either way, paper or digital, that's called, what is it? It's a differentiation. Yes, differentiation. Yeah. Uh, so it's called analog and digital. Paper is analog. Who knew? Whatever. Okay, I also wanted to filter in a couple of things. Both the strategic coordination team and the inquiry team have read a lot about what, what are future forecasts. So they read, for example, the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs Report, right? We looked a lot at that. And that matters, because we have to prepare students, right? We, and the most important thing we learned in a lot of this is that most parents want their kids to be happy, to be fulfilled, to have great, you know, um, contributions, you know, whoever makes them happy to do it. You know, so it's amazing, like, the, how their well-being is really important, but they also get that through, you know, finding, you know, a passion and a purpose. Um, so here's just a quote that's important for you because your profile of an engaged learner happens to be really, you know, two of the areas, analytical thinking and creative thinking, are both embedded in problem solving and creativity in that pro profile of an engaged learner. So those are, they came out on the top two of three different lists. Most important in the workplace in 2023, um, most important that are rising, um, and the other is also in 2027, 2027 projecting out they're still businesses rating them as the most important. This is an international report. So we looked at international, national, um, and we did look at, um, of course, at the state and local. Good evening. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm Keith Pomeroy. I'm the Chief Academic Officer. The first thing I want to do before I get started is I want to interpret something that uh, Dr. Hunt said to you, because I think we sometimes do this. He mentioned the teaching and learning team. 
and that means something to us, but it may not mean something to you. So that is a team of about 70 people from across the district, teachers and administrators, and they meet throughout the school year, and they really look at a lot of information and set direction in terms of professional learning and a lot of the work that we do. So they're a great sounding board as we do this work to give feedback on what we're seeing and what we're building out from our strategic um, priorities as we list them. I want to start by introducing the people from the Engaged Learning Inquiry team who are going to be presenting tonight. So Jessica Voltolini, who twirled for you already. So uh, she is a parent in the district and is also chief of staff um, at the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce. Alice Eichley is here. Uh, so Alice is currently a social studies teacher at Jones Middle School, but she has served in multiple very important roles in the district and has done a lot of work with her peers and we love having her voice in the process. Um, and then Jackie Pratty, who is a parent and the principal at Tremont Elementary School. So this is our first year with Jackie in the district. We're very happy to have her um, serve in multiple roles. She also sometimes wears a gold jacket in to give things to people as a parent and as a principal, so you can do it all. Um, okay, so our process, when we look at this, we actually were guided by, we had a primary inquiry question. So our primary inquiry question is listed here. So what must Upper Arlington schools do to advance academic excellence, elevate student engagement, and prepare students for their future? So again, I think you've heard that talk about their future right? So we are focused on how are we preparing them for their future. That led us to two secondary inquiry questions. So you see both of those secondary inquiry questions listed there. Um, and I think when you look at it, how can we leverage high quality teaching and learning experiences and pre-K-12? And we really do feel that these need to be aligned to our profile of an engaged learner, right? So what are the additional skills that we need to be working within and building within our students. Um, and then the second question being, how can we establish professional learning experiences? Because those are critically important along the way as we try and think about the future and prepare our classrooms. How can we establish professional learning experiences that inspire and empower teachers? A lot of work around the language that we're thinking about when we look at these inquiry questions. So to continuously innovate, to provide high quality instructional support for the individual needs of our diverse student population. So individual needs, how do we create those opportunities for our, our diverse student population? And then when you look at our inquiry approach, just to let you know the things that we were looking at, um, many uh, research articles and national reports and as Denise said, so uh, international reports as well. These are just a few. So we've listed a few that we actually looked at and analyzed as an entire um, inquiry team and then brought back together and wrestled with the elements that were in each of those. And then we looked at district data sources as well. So I think when you look at it, the graduation senior survey data, that's really important. What are we getting from our, our graduates? What are they saying to us? Alumni survey, survey data, same thing. TLT, which is the group that I spoke about before, that 70-person that committee. Um, we did focus groups with that entire, each inquiry team did focus groups with that group of 70 members. That gave us a lot of really, really good feedback from all of those individuals. Um, we took information from the UA Adventure, looked at the, uh, we actually are involved in a Martha Holden Jennings grant around um, self-determined learning, so that's a survey. That's all feedback from our students, right? So what are students saying about their current experience? Um, then we were able to use the listen, learn, and lead data from all the reports that we've got from that, the quality profile, and also the equity audit gave us a lot of really good information for us to look through as we were wrestling with all components of this. So um, our first recommendation, so now we get to our recommendations. And Jackie, you're first up. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about our first recommendation. So after we did all that work that Keith just talked about, all that light reading um, for weeks and weeks and weeks, um, and we got back together, we were excited to um, 
put together this first draft of our first recommendation. So I, if you remember, Denise, or Denise talked about the desired future. And so that's really was important to us to think about as we drafted our recommendation. So when we when we sat down and thought, and thought through this, we thought the district, um, we wanted to remember that the district is focusing on meaningful professional learning tailored to teacher needs and student demographics. We wanted to make sure that we emphasize um, the culture and collaboration of continuous feedback and that we deliberately um, are supporting diverse student populations through expert-led, well-supported initiatives. So with that being said, what we're looking for is a professional learning for school staff that is essential to our continued growth as a district, which brings us to the recommendation that you see here. So we're recommending developing, implementing, and evaluating a comprehensive professional learning plan that connects district goals to the needs of each building and individual staff member as we challenge and support every student. Some of our research showed that professional learning plans are most effective when they're goal-oriented, reflective, individualized, and supported by feedback, um, including strategies for implementation and application. So those are some of the things that we thought about and put into our work as we created this first um, draft of our first recommendation. Um, so I think we talked a little bit um, already, but about the research. So global national research um, on the future of the workforce and workforce um, needs shed light on the importance that we more than ever um, need our students coming out of our K-12 system um, to be have self-determined learning experiences, um, which was reinforced by all of the, the reading of the UA Venture feedback from all of the students here in the district. So when we are thinking about um, the desired future for our second recommendation, um, we really focused on the fact that educational frameworks um, are shifting nationally towards student-centered, resilient learning um, systems that prioritize holistic um, development, amplify student voices, and foster um, lifelong interdisciplinary skills for civic engagement, job creation, um, moving um, away from more traditional um, college-focused education towards a community-based um, skill um, transferable approach. What does that mean? The way I explain it is we've really focused for a long time on what classes students are taking and what course completion looks like, and we're transitioning to skill attainment um, for, our, for all students. So um, in light of the fact that the mission of the, the district is to challenge and support every student every step of the way, um, our inquiry group and our team really focused on wanting to stay focused on both foundational learning, for example, literacy and numeracy are still really important, but we also need to focus moving forward on future ready competencies. Um, as outlined already by the, the profile of engaged learner. So we recommend um, operationalizing the profile of um, an engaged learner by prioritizing um, authentic academic experiences such as service learning, real life learning opportunities, and personalized pathways for, for every student. Okay, I'm the teacher in the group. So I'm gonna change things up because I don't know if you're starting to hear Charlie Brown's teacher. But this is the one that I'm going to talk to you about. But before I do that, I want you to take a second and read it and see if there's a word or a phrase that sort of sticks out to you, something that you think is important or maybe you don't understand. So I'm going to give you wait time. It's going to get quiet. It's OK. OK, does anybody have a word that sticks out that you don't know? I teach eighth graders, and sometimes I use words, and they just look at me, and they're like, yeah, I know it. And I'm like, no, you don't. So is there a word up there that you don't understand? Anybody? It's OK. We're all here to learn. One of the things that I think pops out sometimes is that idea of um, emerging technology. So when we think about desired future and where school plays in that, right? we want to create something that's flexible and dynamic enough to keep up with or attempt to keep up with what's happening outside our schools. So sometimes that's really hard. Education is not known for changing as quickly as the world does. So how do we do that? So here's what we are recommending. 
So we are saying that preparing students for their future, not our past, which is sometimes hard, is imperative with the rapid pace and the change of the world. Therefore, we recommend to continually identify, prioritize, and facilitate the use of emerging technologies. Those are things like AI, virtual reality, augmented reality. How do we use those to help our kids be flexible and dynamic when they leave us? And um, look at those trends and support the learning of teachers along the way. We can't help our kids do that if our teachers don't know how to do that. And sometimes if we're in the same classroom all the time, it's hard to figure that out. So how do we help teachers do that? So think about that. If, take your word with you as you go, or I'll, I'll help you along the way. Now's for your insight. So I did forget to mention something earlier. These are strategies, right? You're feeling like they're high level. There's a whole implementation plan that gets developed by the implementers this fall, which again has ongoing feedback loops. So for each one of these, picture goals under them, um, picture key performance indicators with measures, right? Timelines, action steps. Okay, so the ones that actually get finalized, right? And um, in the briefing reports and then approved by the strategic coordination team. Um, and with the board, um, then those will be brought into life by implementation plans this fall. Um. When I first joined this team, when I heard that I would be on the well-being and belonging team, I automatically thought of my student life and how school affects me and my mental health, and I completely just disregarded how important staff are in the school. So after so many great in-depth conversations with everyone, I am excited to include everyone. <laughs> Alrighty, and then. How can we develop a supportive learning environment and system of school-level resources that foster belonging where every student can be seen, heard, and actively engaged in their school community? So while we were designing these, our primary and secondary inquiry questions, we definitely took into consideration not only our student, but our staff well-being as well. And we plan to incorporate and create this culture by implementing our ideas into our programs, our policies, and our practices in order to really create that safe and supporting environment that everyone in the classroom deserves. Inquiry approach. We too, like the other two inquiry teams, looked at um, current research, national research, same reports. Um, and really dug in and read and summarized those things so that we were able to grasp or at least attempt to grasp what the future may hold for us as educators and our students. The, some of the key points that we saw um, come about from these articles include um, individualized student needs that kept, that kept um, surfacing, teachers evolving from being knowledge gatekeepers to learning choreographers, fostering student-centered approaches, and the need to support teachers around those approaches. And the report emphasizes the importance of supporting teachers through technology to enhance teaching methods and to be able to save time, ultimately elevating the educational experience. Another um, place that we looked for research and guidance was um, a book written by Dr. Susie Wise from the Stanford D School entitled Design for Belonging, How to Build Inclusion and Collaboration in Your Communities. Um, her book really talks about how we see, how we feel, and how we shape belonging by identifying different levers of opportunity to we, that we have accessible to us in order to build inclusion and collaboration. Oops, did it again. We had to dig a little deeper though. Um, we needed to look at local data. We spent a lot of time looking at um, really a lot of data that we had submitted to the Insight Education Equity Audit this past fall. So we had a lot of raw data to look at. We had demographic data. Um, we had panorama, sense of belonging, and emotional regulation data. Uh, we had 
listen, learn, and lead, the quality reports, um, stay safe, speak up, hotline data. Who's using that? How, how is it being used? We had data from our signs of suicide summary experiences at the middle school and high school. And we had former Gallup survey data from our staff members. But again, that wasn't enough. We wanted to know more. We wanted real, current, in the moment knowledge. So we, we did some focus group inquiries. Um, we did use our TLT, that's the big group of 75 people that um, we, Keith had talked about earlier. We did focus groups with that group of staff. We took specific input from our school counseling group. Um, we also reached out beyond the district to some several leadership groups. Um, Franklin County School Wellbeing Coordinators, they do exist in other school districts. We wanted to learn from them and what was happening in the area of well-being in other school districts. We also reached out to our Franklin County Equity Coordinators. How are they addressing different topics to address inclusion? Um, and we also surveyed a lot of our students, middle school and high school. We surveyed over 92 student groups and clubs um, to get their input on their sense of uh, well-being and belonging. So we wanted that real live data to look at to drive the work that we did in the recommendations that we're making. Highlights of the desired future. Our vision is guided by a core belief that the school operates as the heartbeat of the community and exemplifies the opportunities and values of the community without question, qualification, or exception. We can achieve this only when all students and staff are engaged, feel valued, and are authentic contributors to the school community. Additionally, when we are able to provide all students with equitable opportunities and access to high quality educational experiences, we will be able to fulfill the expectations of the profile of an engaged learner and our students will be prepared to serve, lead, and succeed. Uh, this is the start with heart uh, recommendation. Um, we make a recommendation here, you can read it. We recommend designing and sharing accessible information, implementing consistent onboarding and welcoming approaches for new residents, students, and staff. We believe there's a sense to increase the sense of belonging and connection in this district. We know that research on increasing community belonging demonstrates that the use of an innovation or invitational approach for entering into a new community can lead to active participation in that community. Start with heart approach. Welcome the people into our district, into our community, into our buildings, all of them, and have a consistent process that's in place. So. I'm Matt Jordan, the Chief Talent Officer for the district, by the way, which makes it appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Angie Thaker. I'm a parent of uh, three kids in the district. I have two at Jones and one at the high school. Um, excited to be part of this committee. So our second recommendation here is about equity and voice. So we recommend developing intentional structures and systems for representation of voices across underrepresented populations. Um, during all of this, I kept trying to go down to the details, and then Denise would come around and go, stay high level, stay high level, and you're taking too much time. And so um, I, I still like to get kind of down in the details and what does that mean. So just some examples, and these are just my ideas, but everybody's here to uh, present their own ideas, is how can we look at committees? So you look at this teaching and learning team that um, they've referenced a couple times tonight, but do we have diverse voices represented um, across all of our staff members, marginalized populations? Are they part, are we intentional in who we put on these um, committees that are making recommendations? Um, I also work at Ohio State University and we have a, a staff and student senate that gets to meet directly with the president of the university. So would love to see an idea where students and staff kind of have a regular check-in with the president of this university. Um, so just some ideas on kind of what that might look like. Good. Um, so I, I am really appreciative as a parent um, and, and this is my second strategic planning uh, process support of, of the district and it really is something I'm proud of that this district puts well-being and belongingness right in the center of it. And that's meaningful because it means that we understand that a, a child, a student, and a staff's well-being is central to them moving forward and them to really understand um, that that is, is really the foundation of how we do uh, good work, innovation and excellence that was talked about. So the first uh, recommendation that we have around, uh, around access and engagement is we recommend 
um, establishing a system for measuring equitable access and engagement with the curriculum, resources, and school community. So as, as we talked about, nearly all school and community stakeholders that we talked through and all the data sources suggested that belonging uh, and connection are foundational for engaged learning and well-being. So we're kind of the bridge between engaged learning. To do this well, we need well-being to be part of this center. And to do that, we need inclusive materials. We need accessible materials for all folks at the spectrum of learning abilities and make sure that we have not only um, opportunities to open the door for those who are excelling and those also those who have learning challenges that need those, those needs accessible to them. So, um, this could take the form that we'll talk about in implementation in lots of different ways, but we want to meet young people where they are, and we want to make sure they have the tools to be successful, and we need to make sure that those tools represent who they are, where they're coming from, and allow them to feel like they're part of this district uh, 100%. Um, all right. Um, and the second, the second piece is, is something we also heard a lot from students, from staff, from caregivers, from everyone in the community, and that is um, how do we make sure that the innovative technology that will drive future learning, future opportunities, make this world a, a global environment, how do we make sure that it also doesn't undermine the well-being of our, our students? So there's this tension there, and we're not going to disregard technology and not make sure it's part of what we're doing, but we need to make sure it's integrated in a way that's thoughtful and very, very intentional. And I think a lot of the emerging research is trying to get at how do we, how do we blend this in a way that's uh, much more sort of intentional and allows for kids to improve and, and move forward in a way that's helpful. Um, so we recommend developing a technology use framework informed by key stakeholders involving student, staff, and family voices. This is not going to be an easy uh, area to navigate, but I think what we need to um, understand is that learning and retention and attention are impacted by some of this technology, and how do we, how do we negotiate that? So we're really uh, excited to dig into this work, and I think it will be helpful for the well-being of our young people who are facing lots of information, lots of technology, lots of emerging trends, um, and we can use that, but we've got to be thoughtful about it. Uh, so, uh, climate and culture were two words that continually emerged um, from our research, and so our, um, when we were listening to Ellen do our secondary inquiry questions, uh, we talked about staff and students feeling heard. And so, in order to be able to confidently gather authentic feedback in areas that will provide insight to increasing student and staff voice, choice, and agency, we are recommending developing implementing and applying the results of a routine climate and culture survey. Our research showed us that climate surveys are valuable tools for gathering feedback from not only students and teachers and staff, but also families to understand their experiences and their perspectives. And this data can inform initiatives and interventions aimed at improving school climate. We know that if we don't monitor climate and culture, then we're not valuing it. And we want to recognize and celebrate the successes in living the values that we hold close to our hearts. Thank you. And our final, final recommendation focuses on equitable ac access. So this refers to our curriculum and well as our co-curricular programs that we have within the district. We want to make sure we're very focused on the racially, culturally, and identity conscious curriculum and teaching practices that are beneficial to all educators and learners. And an equitable learning environment provides the culture, climate, and content needed to enable all students to thrive in a global world. We recommend strengthening and refining a protocol for evaluating curriculum consistently and addressing disparities in course demographics. We want our curriculum to be representative of the world and inclusive of the broader community to ensure each student has a learning experience that honors who they are. We want to make sure our resources and curriculum are not disparaging to any group of people, leaving them out, doing them harm, etc. Major focus for us. Number six. Thank you. So Google um, 
was very invested in education. Uh, we, we use Google Docs all the time, right? Google Slides, this is Google Slides. Uh, Google Sheets, everything, Google Classrooms. Um, so they've invested in um, a series of reports. I encourage you, very easy to find. <laughs> um, there's three different reports and there's three different focus areas in each report. This is a quote from one. Um, experts argue that exposure to this new world of work should start earlier to give students the opportunity to shape their career pathways and aspirations over time rather than simply focusing on their first job after formal education. So really reinforcing the importance of paying attention to the workforce, where it's going, what kind of skills. Um, and these are not just skills of doing things, right, but also of being, right? Um, so collaboration skills, analytical skills, all part of that. So I'd like to invite Karen Truitt. So I'm Karen Truitt, I am the Chief Communications Officer and you will hear from me real quick and you will also hear from two of our other amazing team members, Margie Pizzuti, who is a resident. She is the former CEO of Goodwill Columbus and my favorite of her roles is she was a board member here in the UA for 12 years. So she has served the district very well for a very long time. Um, Amanda Hofsis is also here. She is a parent and she is the Vice President of Planning, Architecture, and Real Estate at OSU. We also had a primary inquiry question. What must Upper Arlington schools do to advance engaged communication, partnerships, and stewardship of resources? And we broke that down into three areas here. So the first one is how can we broaden engagement into a communication with students, staff, parents, and community stakeholders to strengthen connections and support student learning experiences. The second, how can we strengthen and leverage partnerships within our community to provide broad, real-world learning experiences for students, which will better prepare them for success in a global society. And finally, how can we prioritize limited resources to benefit student learning and our school community, as well as addressing the challenges of our remaining aging school buildings? So our inquiry uh, approach was similar to the other teams. We started, of course, with some of our local research like Listen, Learn, Lead, the equity audit. Um, our team had the fun of going back to 2017 and digging into a little thing called the Facilities Master Planning Report. Does anybody remember that thing? Yeah, that was a lot of work. Um, and some of you may have even been involved in that process as well. Um, we also looked at financial reports such as the annual financial update, the five-year forecast, things like that because we do have more of a focus on the financial resources as well. And I guess I can just look up here. So here is our first strategic recommendation. I'll get my notes, maybe. Um, so the first one is just about communication structures. And we believe that the transparent and clear communication about all aspects of our district is at the heart of a strong relationship that we want to continue to foster among our schools and our stakeholders. Therefore, we recommend expanding, refining, and streamlining communication structures and systems based on new technology and evolving stakeholder needs to provide internal and external audiences easy, equitable, and timely access to information about our schools. And our next piece was more about the two-way or the engaged communication. And that was understanding that our families and community have a strong desire for connection with our schools and that our schools benefit from the investment of time and resources by these stakeholders. We recommend expanding the opportunities in personal, in, I'm sorry, in person, virtual, or electronic for stakeholders to engage in two-way communication with district staff members and board of education members. Expanding the engagement opportunities between our schools and community will strengthen these relationships and further enhance the student experience. experience. I'm actually honored and privileged to be able to share with you uh, the next two uh, recommendations. And uh, in order to sort of frame the Partnerships for Pathways uh, recommendation, as Karen said, we really did a lot of outreach to a lot of our community stakeholders, both locally as well as um, throughout Ohio and nationally. So, uh, and and as as Dr. Hunt said, it's it is all about continuous improvement. We're a high-performing district. Uh, we know that. However there's always an opportunity to elevate the work that we're doing to serve our students. So 
uh, and as Karen actually also teed it up, uh, we've done that. We've looked at best practices uh, from other districts, uh, and we did a deep dive with many of our current partners in the community. We're really blessed to have partners that are fully engaged in the district. Uh, businesses, Rotary, Kiwanis, Upper Arlington Education Foundation, thank you very much, <laughs> Alice Finley, for all that you do to partner with the, uh, the district. The city, many, many resources, library, um, the Upper Arlington Community Foundation, we have a lot of good partners. This is an opportunity, though, I think, to, we believe, to elevate those partnerships, to find new and different ways that we can take advantage of what resources they have and what we can do to support our students as they move forward through the district. So uh, it is about continuous improvement. And, and what we learned to some degree is there's a discipline around developing and enhancing partnerships. And Denise, you gave me some really Im uh, kind of an important uh, document that talks about the methodology and the six, six factors of developing partnerships. And I think it was very helpful for us. So, uh, so in order to frame this recommendation, we learned the importance of partnerships for student learning to increase real world learning and to help them envision their future. Um, other than college, by the way, and that was an important learning for us. We also learned that Upper Arlington Schools um, is rich with partnerships, as I said a little bit ago, but locating and identifying all these, we've identified them and we know who, who those contacts are, but again, uh, what can we do to leverage these partnerships more effectively? Um, which led us to the realization um, and to re reaffirm that understanding and accessing partnership opportunities needs to be more accessible and intentional. We really need to think about how we can leverage those partnerships more intentionally. Um, based upon these uh, challenges and the des desired future, um, here's um, some of our recommendations. So to broaden um, post high school opportunities beyond higher education, um, and to help students identify interests and viable career options, that's where we recommended uh, expanding strategic partnerships to provide students with exploratory learning experiences in career, military, and entrepreneurship pathways throughout their secondary education. So forecasting regarding the future of work indicates that the importance of, and this really resonated with, uh, with our, entire, uh, our entire group um, during this process is career technical fields, skilled trades, and specialized expertise. Uh, the growth of technology, this is no surprise, the, the growth of technology-based industries locally are producing many viable opportunities for industry-recognized credentials, leading to long-term employment and stability. So we really understood looking beyond the importance and the value of higher education to really exposing our students to a broader base of opportunities. So that was the first, and now I'm gonna totally blow this, let me see. The big one, okay, thank you. I, I know how to, big, I know, <laughs> I can, thank you very much. And so, um, again, to tee up the second recommendation we have here, um, access to partnerships. Uh, in, in order to maximize and increase awareness of and the access uh, to community partnerships, and again, to really codify and be much more intentional about those partnerships, um, we recommend developing a database to include information regarding community partnership opportunities, extracurriculars, and co-curricular offerings. So the strong relationships um, between community partnerships and the schools increase students' academic achievement, involvement, and motivation. 
Additionally, they allow students to foster networking opportunities and explore various career options. So by leveraging in a really strategic and intentional way, all of these partners we have in the community, we can uh, really help students earlier and earlier, not just in high school, but we learned of some best practices around the country where in middle school and even elementary school, they're beginning to introduce the notion of a career path or what individuals are interested in. So we want to leverage all of that in order to make sure that our students are given every opportunity. So, uh, Connections and communication number five, which is about our facilities. Um, this is all around this notion of stewardship of resources. And um, we, we thought a lot about it. And, and we really believe that when we talk about um, the stewardship of resources, being a good steward means really making the most out of the resources that you have. So it's a, a prioritization of those resources in order to make sure that uh, we're getting the most out of them. Um, and bottom line, um, we heard from all of the research we were looking into, do more, but don't spend more. And as we know, that's real easy. Um, but it, it just means you have, to, you have to work really hard at prioritization. You have to continually review things and make sure um, that you're getting it right and that you're getting the most out of every dollar. Um, and then, you know, some of our assets in this um, amazing uh, district are incredible. We have a number of just phenomenal um, facilities that are um, well-designed and give us modern, um, modern education facilities to learn in. And we also have Burbank, Jones, and Hastings. Um, just kidding, that was supposed to be a joke. Uh, <laughs> But we know that there's some work to do in a few of our older buildings. Um, and so we know that that's uh, a meaningful um, effort ahead of us. So uh, we recommend establishing a process for uh, reviewing and updating the facilities master plan. And I'm on the wrong one. No, I'm not. OK. The facilities master plan, uh, options, cost estimating, um, community desires and funding strategies. And those are really important, especially for those three schools where we know there's a lot of outstanding um, deferred maintenance and asset needs that we need to address. And then the last one, resource allocation uh, in general. Uh, we recommend formalizing the prioritization process um, for our resource allocation so that it, it, we, are, we are certain that it is supporting student learning outcomes. And so that formalized process we think is going to be critical to helping us make those um, recommendations and getting the most out of our dollars. I'm going to invite the Engage Learning team if you guys want to come up. I, I'm going to attempt to address this question, and then Alice can um, help if, if you want. Maybe on this one. I like how she presents. So, OK, do you feel that colleges and universities are on the same page with regard to the shift from classes to skills? Will this still set up our students, graduates, to be appealing to colleges and universities? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and I apologize if I um, led anyone to believe that 
content knowledge is not important. That was not at all what we were intending to say. So it's really about, in addition to students learning course content, it's about the applicability then of that, that learning and that content in every aspect of like the educational experience. So how are students taking what they learn in the classroom and applying it to real world experiences through internships, externships, apprenticeships, pre-apprenticeships, um, volunteer opportunities, um, et cetera. So really the skill attainment is with respect to again, operation operationalizing the skills this district have, has already set forth in the profile of engaged learner, how you elevate that skill attainment and then apply it to like the future um, jobs that don't even exist yet. So absolutely, it's for all students, whether they're career ready um, or going straight into the workforce, enrolling into, enlisting into the military or starting their own business. Okay, um, well, not only do I teach eighth graders here, but I am also a student, so I am currently in a graduate school, so I am, I'm almost there. I'm officially all but dissertation. How crazy is that? That's incredible. Um, I would say yes, skills are primarily what we're looking for, right? So it doesn't matter, this is how I look at it in my history class, right? We might be studying the American Revolution, but we're gonna be talking about making connections, asking questions, um, communicating ideas. We're just doing it through the lens of the American Revolution. And then now in May, we're talking about the Civil War and we're doing those same skills. We're just doing it through a different framework of content. So the skills we're adding to our skill set, but we're doing it through different lenses and that lens is the content, is how I would say that. And I think it's important that we're not only helping our kids with the profile of an engaged learner, but also looking at our staff as learners and how we're encouraging them to hold those attributes as learners and leaders at the same time. We had more come in, so we're trying to gather all of these um, as much as possible. I guess the first one uh, that I have here is, will there uh, be individual learning plans for both students and teachers? So as we talk about creating more options and more pathways, those options give students the opportunity to kind of guide their path in terms of uh, focusing on their passion, their interests, and consider other opportunities along the way. Um, and the same with teachers trying to create that space as we build out a professional learning plan, we really need to create opportunities where there, there's an ability to differentiate within the teacher space so that they can pursue things that are necessary for their classroom as they see needs and see um, different things they need to respond to within their classroom. But again, both focused on preparing for the future. We need to think about what that means for us as, um, as a profession, as we're supporting our kids, and for our kids, how are we creating opportunities for that? So creating pathways is about creating opportunities for kids to define their individual direction and, and create those plans with those opportunities. Oh, we're down to one minute. Dang. And then, okay, so I guess with our one minute, I'm going to read these questions, and it sounds like we're, we're going to uh, then take them back to the team to discuss these. So um, when you think about UA in five years or ten years, how might learning look different? Um, will it just be tweaks to the same structure, or will the content, community, and culture be very different to better represent the needs of both students and faculty for a constant, constantly changing world? Good question. Uh, the next one is, in a world that is constantly changing, um, possessing a creative disposition is essential. How will UA schools develop the creative disposition of all students and faculty? So, and is underlined, so not skipping faculty. Um, and then the last one here is, I noticed the word engagement and innovation are used. My question is, how will the district prioritize engagement in the face of scripted curriculum? How will UA schools be innovative and challenge the status quo of typical districts instead of merely keeping up with, and I'm not even, uh, 
instead of just keeping up with them is the last word. Okay, so I think when you hear scripted curriculum, there's a lot of changes happening at state level, so there are things that we're implementing, so that's, I think, tied to that question as well. We're, we're past our one minute, or are we? Okay. Where will we place those answers, do you believe? So, okay, it's going to help the... And I think the question is, will they be posted somewhere later? I, okay. Okay. So there are questions that will go back to the inquiry team and work with the inquiry team on that. Okay. I think we all have some. Um, I'm going to read through four of these because they're all kind of in the same category, and then we'll talk a little bit. Um, will you consider tightening smartphone usage policies during schools as other – exemplary academic institutions are doing locally, like CSG and St. Charles, and or aligning with a national initiative such as wait until 8th. Um, I know that is definitely something on the table. Everybody's talking about that right now, um, waiting for some direction from our, uh, from our government, from the governor's office on the expectation around schools, but uh, that conversation I know has already started in our, in our school district. Um, what practical ideas are being considered regarding balanced technology use, and how can we contribute to the balanced technology use? Um, it's funny, and I'm going to call upon Brad Pettit, who is kind of a colleague. He is the director of technology in Bexley and a parent, and we met the Central Ohio Tech leaders actually had a meeting today, and this was a topic of conversation that everybody, all the districts are having right now. How do we develop a balanced plan, framework, process with all the technology that students have access to today. It's a question that everybody's got to grapple with, and I think this is something that is necessary that we will work through um, a collaborative process with parent input, with student input, um, talking to other districts for sure, and, and listening to expectations that the governor's office has for us. Given preteens um, spend six to eight hours daily on screen time, given the recent research around technology addiction in kids and teens, why are middle school students required to use a smartphone for school activities? Are there plans with regard to this? Um, we give all our kids iPads that are baked in with a filtering system that happens 24 seven on any internet network you may be connected to. We also give parents the ability to turn off that internet outside of school hours for short periods of time or for the entire time that they're outside of school. Um, we give parents a lot of access to see what the students are um, visiting, what YouTube videos, what things are blocked, what is allowed. So um, I'm not sure about the smartphone use and what what that's about. Our expectation is students have access to a highly monitored device that we provide to them. So if they're using their own smartphones, I really can't comment on that right now. Um, I can look into it if somebody wants to talk to me afterward. Um, next, in addition to welcoming staff and community, how do the families and staff who leave influence and how do we welcome new um, how we welcome new members. Will we be able to do exit interviews? Funny that you say that. So that is a recommendation that has come out of our Insight Equity Audit is interviewing exiting staff and families. Um, our chief talent officer does um, exit interviews with staff members who leave the district and we are actually taking a framework that Insight provided to us as a resource and are now um, having multiple eyes upon an exit interview in the, in the form of a Google form um, to provide to families who withdraw at the end of the school year so we can start to collect some of that data. So that is in the works. Um, in terms of the one question is, what strategies are important to truly hear, assess, and embrace student voice? I think we have talked as a group and within the uh, inquiry documents that we've talked about, about ensuring that students have a real authentic voice, that you're not just hearing them or, or rubber stamping something, that it's nothing about us without us, that you're making sure that kids are part of the ground level 
creation of content activities, clubs, and that it's really representative and inclusive of who they are. Uh, what defines an underrepresented population? Does this include religious and political beliefs? I would say an underrepresented population is any population that doesn't have a voice, doesn't have power, doesn't have authority to provide input and isn't represented uh, in the activities that they're taking part of. So I think we want to make sure we've created an environment where folks feel uh, connected, they have a place and a level of belonging uh, across all spectrums of how they identify, and that's really important in education. Um, well-being, and there's just a couple comments here, not questions, that we want to make sure we're focusing on safety and security, which is important to well-being, and that we want to make sure that there's uh, time for unstructured free play and eating lunch, which um, are, are fair. So. Okay, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, what strategies are needed to help students explore career pathway options at an earlier age? Great question. And we have some examples of other school districts, one in Naperville and in uh, California that we've been talking about that really give us a framework for how to do that. But we'll also do some more research and find out about other opportunities to begin to, at an earlier age, introduce students to what career options are. So, good question. And this one is more, uh, almost more of a thought than a question, but um, I feel like it needs to, it's, it's worthy of reading out loud too. We need to teach students how to think. We cannot expect them to know how networking is such a critical skill. So teaching students to understand, like getting out there and the socializing and the, those face-to-face -face interactions are, um, are really just as important as the test scores that they're earning and that kind of thing, so. And I didn't want to discount these other engaged learning ones, but they seem like things really like more at the action level, and they actually have to be considered by the inquiry team. So let me just refresh what's next in terms of phase two of the process, which is where we are right now. Um, board is going to weigh in and give us their input as well. This is going to be posted online for additional community um, input, you know, same um, that, that you have tonight. And if you didn't, if you felt rushed, you'll be able to go back hopefully at that time. I know time's at an essence of, of an essence always. The t inquiry teams meet again. They'll apply the feedback that you submitted um, and also um, these as well. They'll start looking at those. Um, they're not the ones developing the implementation plan, though. The implementers develop the implementation plan. So that'll be the educators this fall um, really working on that. Um, and uh, students will be involved in trying to help us to understand that as well. Um, so this can be an ongoing all the way through December until we're finished with the process. Um, but May 22nd is when the, the inquiry teams come back together. We'll look at all of this collective feedback and we'll make revisions to all the strategy recommendations that you see so that those briefing reports can be produced. And so in June, um, the board will have those briefing reports uh, and we'll be able to start then thinking about implementation and how do we develop the actual goals, you know, key performance indicators and action steps, you know, and the timelines for those two. Because there's so many, we have to prioritize those. So a lot of people will weigh in on that prioritization. Um, so there was another question, too, that Bob wants to address, um, but I'll just tee up. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I facilitated the strategic planning process here um, for the last three times. Um, and every time we do it, everyone wants to be on an inquiry team or everyone wants to be on the strategic coordination team. Like, nobody wants to be left out. This is a very highly engaged community, right? This is amazing. Um, and so there has to be a way to how do we, like, invite people or... Um, you know, select people, whatever that is. And from my experiences, I don't just do Upper Arlington strategic planning. I've done it in many other um, very influential school districts. Here's what we don't do. We don't do an all call. Hey, everybody, who wants to be on it? Because what's happened in the past when we do that, we end up with 60, 70, 80 people. And we, we messed up last time, honestly. We had one team, and I'll, you know, John and, when, and Jackie you were doing the well-being team, which was the first time, one of the first districts to really have a well-being focus. We ended up with 65 people on the well-being team. Okay, and so what we had to do was we had to set up tiers, right? We had a team that was called the inquiry team of about 25 people that met like this team did. 
and then everyone else was on an advisory team. And then people were upset they were on the advisory team and not on the inquiry team. So you do your very darndest, right, to make sure you've got nice representation from all kinds of different perspectives and voices when you're doing it. And you still end up stepping on a pile of, I'm not saying it. But, you know, like, it's just like, it's really hard, right? It's a hard thing. Um, this time around, um, what we ended up doing was sitting down and, and uh, we, I know that the, the district, your team sat down. We looked at uh, other people we, in trying to figure out who were the best representatives of you know, different groups. So what groups do we need to target? We need lots of families. We need lots of students, right? We need people who have expertise. One of the things the board charged us with when we, we put together kind of the principles for the design of this work in, in September was we do need to continue with community chairs, something UA has always done in the last three times I've done it, and I've really appreciated that, is that someone from the community who has an expertise and a stake in the outcomes and a deep expertise has helped to co-chair the inquiry teams. And you heard from, you know, well, you know, we heard from all three of them today. Um, so that was amazing. We had that too, that depth of knowledge is so important, but they also care about the outcome of that. Um, so having that established and then making sure we have teacher voices and student voices and also there's a lot of misconceptions out there so it's important to make sure we have people on these teams who actually have access to what is really happening if i'm a parent of an elementary school teacher or t children and my kids haven't gotten to high school yet i don't know about high school programming so how do we make sure we have you know parents and teachers representing and counselors you know from different grades different grade spans so um, it was very complicated and if there were people who were really want to be part of it we're sorry that you weren't part of it uh, we're doing our darndest to make sure that you know you do get involved and i thank those of you who did the inquiry teams themselves have already met for 16 hours of time um, so unlike he said the sunniest days that that there were, of course. And I know you probably want to add on to that from a district perspective as well. I think, Denise, you just covered everything I was going to say. Um, I, I, I think from that perspective, you know, I think the, the numbers about 75 people were involved. We tried to also have a balance of people that were involved in the past and new thought to that. So about 80% of the members are new. Uh, so in that, the other piece of that is this is about continued engagement. So your feedback is very much appreciative. And, um, a, a couple things, and, and I won't respond uh, specific to questions, but I think loud and clear on the uh, screen time and cell phone use, that's a well-being uh, piece that I know was discussed there that we need to uh, continue. Uh, I like the way this was framed because it was framed about how do, how do community members elevate concerns, and I think that goes to that um, whole engagement piece, that communication piece, providing opportunities uh, to engage with uh, administration, uh, Board of Education, and developing plans to uh, provide those opportunities as well. Um, I, I do want to just uh, recognize and thank everyone uh, that put their time and energy. Uh, we, we all have very busy lives and to dedicate the time and energy uh, to this uh, initiative is very much appreciated. So let's give one final round of applause for everyone involved uh, and here and not here. Thank you very much. Also, I, I will not do this to the community leads, but I can do this to our administrative co-chairs. Um, we will hang around up here. If you have specific questions or if you want to ask anything else, we'll stay here tonight. And again, uh, encourage you, I know a little bit rushed with the QR codes and everything else. Um, as you kind of take all of this information in, uh, feel free to use the video to provide us more feedback. And, and certainly, we'd just encourage you to help us spread the word that this is out there and available. Uh, to provide, provide some feedback into this process as we go into the next phase. So thank you all for being here, and I think the uh, rain has stopped, if I can judge it by the sound on the ceiling, so uh, have a, at least a dry ride, ride home. Have a good evening.